you, Chris. Thank you, everyone else, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, my plan is to try and just give some of the uh, insights or some thoughts I have based on having been quite involved in public engagement and digital outreach for nearly 10 years now. Um, just introduce myself briefly. So I'm a senior lecturer at Royal Holloway. Uh, I'm a glaciologist or a glacial geologist. Uh, I like to study glaciers today and glaciers in the past and think about how they might behave in the future. Um, I particularly enjoy field work, so doing, going out to the field, mucking around near a glacier, but I also spend a lot of time looking at satellite imagery. Um, I've been working in public science communication since about 2012 when I set up my website, which is called Antarctic Glaciers. Uh, Antarctic Glaciers acts a little bit like an online textbook. So I've been writing content for this website and providing it for free for everyone uh, for, for nigh on 10 years. Um, I've also got a, uh, I'm also quite active on Twitter, got a few followers on Twitter. Uh, other forms of public engagement I've been doing include working with people at Time of Geography to make videos. And most recently, this exciting project that I'm really enthusiastic about, which is these Antarctic story maps. And that's what Chloe is helping me with at the moment. And I also have uh, two more people on the team. So we've got this big, te big team of people all working on these story maps project at the moment. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about them in a moment. Um, so this is what Antarctic Glaciers looks like. Um, I've been uh, in receipt, receipt of some really generous funding over the years. Uh, it's currently funded by the International Association of Sedimentologists, who've committed to a three-year funding programme. Um, and I also currently got active at an Antarctic science bursary, which is how we funded um, Laura's time on the Story Maps project. Um, I've also received my funding from the BSG, funding from my university, funding from SCAR, all, lots of different things. And this funding is used, initially it was used mostly for website design, for development, for the programmer to work on the website, but also for things like domain name acquisition and hosting, because as the website got more visitors, I had to uh, increase the hosting capacity, basically. Uh, the BSG allowed me to go to a conference with a few assistants, uh, a teachers conference and actually speak to teachers, which was incredibly valuable and I learned a lot from that. Um, and what the funding is mostly used for these days is to fund a succession of early career website assistants who help develop content for the website. And this enables me to uh, provide more content than I could just do on my own, given that I have already a full time position in the university. So I'm able to provide much more high quality uh, content that I just wouldn't have time to do uh, on my own. Um, and so I've employed a series of early career researchers and I'd like to think that they've got a lot out of it. I've certainly got a lot out of it, but they get um, training, they get a lot of mentoring um, and they can always uh, go on afterwards to do whatever it is they're going on next to do. They tend to work quite flexibly, choose their own hours uh, and produce content and time that works for them. So currently, um, employing someone who's, you know, this sort of early career stage, she'll be starting a PhD in September, and I'd, I'd like to think this has been a good opportunity for her, as well as providing great content for the website. Um, the website has received so, a few accolades. Um, recently received a certificate of excellence from the Geologists Association. Um, it's, it's fairly regularly cited in the printed media, so in newspapers, or, well, I suppose it's People, everyone reads their newspapers online these days, but you know, in the in the digital media. Um, and I also have an email address associated with the website, and I'm pretty frequently contacted through that email address by journalists. Uh, so the journalists often say, "Oh, I found your website. Please, can I interview about this? Or please, can you comment on this? Uh, so there's a paper coming out. Please, can you comment on it for my article I'm writing? Or can I interview or interview or something like that?" Uh, and I think really as a result of being involved in digital communication and digital environments i'm increasingly asked to do that to appear in these and in the printing in the media so fairly regularly being interviewed by the bbc and sky news which is quite fun um 
I know that the website is well used by teachers and students and I can trace that via trackbacks so I can look at who's referring to the website, who's linking to the website and I can see oh this university is using it as one of their recommended resources or this school is using it as one of their recommended resources. And then I also have Google Analytics and it tells me that I've got 47 pages with first impressions which means that they are coming up first in Google search in Google searches. Uh, on average, around 30,000 visitors to their website per month it tends to be higher in term time and lower in the holidays because the website is fairly academic and I think people are using it alongside their studies. So it goes down in the holidays, it goes down at Christmas and it goes up a lot in May when people are doing their exam revision. Uh, and it's had uh, over 3.5 million visitors or page views since I launched it. The um, Story Maps project is very exciting. This is funded by an Antarctic science bursary. It's also supported by a bunch of really um, exceptional institutions like the British Antarctic Survey, ESRI, um, uh, Geography Southwest. Um, we've had Sentinel have been helping us with it, the, you know, the satellite people. Um, we've had a number of colleagues from different universities getting involved. And so this has been uh, really exciting. If you haven't experienced a story map before, they're really quite cool. Um, basically, they're a series of interactive web maps and you can work around that web map to put in place videos, images, text, all sorts of interactive content. You can embed websites in the story map so you can do all sorts of cool things and it allows you to tell a story. So we've got four planned three are complete and published. We're working on the last one, which is what Chloe's helping on. So she's working on people in Antarctica. This is going to be published hopefully uh, by the end of August. Um, and we're going to be working on telling a story not only about the exploration of Antarctica and not just about the traditional story we all know very well, but you know maybe the, some of the stories we don't know, like when was the first polar pride? When was the first person of colour in Antarctica? When was the first woman in Antarctica? When did they overwinter? Things like that. Other kinds of firsts. Um, and this is targeting a younger age group than my website has traditionally focused on. So we're looking at maybe around 14 to 15 years old. So Google Analytics is quite useful for me because it gives me insights into who my audience is and where they come from. So this is the, you only get data for people over the age of 18, so it doesn't tell you about people under the age of 18. But it does tell me that most people are fairly young, half are, half are under 35. Um, and it tells me that people, three quarters of people, are finding my website through Google. So in that pie chart there, direct, there's a, what, 20% 20, 20 are direct. That means they're typing antarcticglaciers.org into they're, they're typing the URL in and going directly there. Uh, the blue is organic search. That's basically Google, maybe some Bing, things like that, but basically, or DuckDuckGo or whatever people are using, but that's people typing it into Google and finding it through there. Um, then we have some social traffic. That's the little red sliver. So that's people coming through from, um, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, things like that. And then referral is people following a link. So you can see that it's Google that's bringing me my traffic. It's people who don't know anything, they type a word into Google and they find my website and they read an article about it. And you can see this in the in the views. So if there's a news article about Pine Island Glacier, my Pine Island Glacier article on the website gets a huge boost in traffic. And people are just going, what is Pine Island Glacier? And they type it in and they come to my website. This is just where people have come from in July uh, last month. And you can see that this is really used globally. It's used a lot in the US and UK, but also India, um, but pretty much everywhere in the country, everywhere in the world, people are coming to the website. So this is this is a globally useful resource and it goes beyond beyond Britain. This is used internationally. 88% um, of people have been uh, first time visitors. They've never come to the website before. 12% are a returning visitor who've come to the website at least once before. So over the years, by evaluating the website, by thinking about what's worked well and what hasn't worked well, 
And through my own analysis of the peer reviewed literature and through my own contributions to the science communication literature, um, I've been thinking about what often people need to be thinking about when they're setting up some kind of digital outreach tool. And the biggest issue is that people haven't always thought about what their audience is and they just start writing. I see this quite often because uh, I often invite colleagues to contribute to my website and they're not used to thinking about who's going to be reading it. They're used to the academic audience, they're not used to the other audiences. You really need to be thinking about who am I writing for and what, why am I writing for them? What is what do they need? What do they want? The second thing that people need to do is you have to tell them why they should care. And that has to be blatant and has to be upfront and has to be pretty much the first thing they read. If you read an article on the BBC News website, that first paragraph tells you the key headlines and then the rest is supporting details. And that's the way we need to be thinking about writing. We need to tell them why, why they should care and what those key headlines are right up at the start. The next thing that people need to think about is jargon and it just slips in because it's a shorthand, right? It allows us to say something quite quickly, it allows us to save words. But if you have too much jargon, people just they get turned off, they don't understand it. I also think there is an issue of not explaining key concepts. A really key example might be the West Antarctic ice sheet. We can't talk about the West Antarctic ice sheet without thinking about ice shelves and marine ice sheet instability. This is why the West Antarctic ice sheet is of interest. But if you go up to the person in the street, the average person, you tell them West Antarctica is important because it has like ice shelves that are vulnerable, they won't know what an ice shelf is and they'll get very confused. So we have to explain those things before we can explain why West Antarctica is a problem because people don't understand the, that basic background. And I think this is often a problem with news stories. Then this is why people then Google it and think, well, you know, surely Antarctica is just massive. Surely we shouldn't care about it. And also, we're living in an area of false news. How do we show that our work is trustworthy? How do we show that it's important? How do we show that it's right? The way I do this is I always include the citations back to the original literature in my articles and I use this numbering system so it's not too intrusive but I encourage people to think about that so that people can see where that fact comes from because people are suspicious and they should be in this in this day and age where false news is so important. Make it easy to fact check your project, make it easy to show where that data has come from. So if you were to put together some kind of science communication strategy, we need to challenge what is known as the knowledge deficit model. The knowledge deficit model says quite simply, I know more because I'm a scientist and I'm going to tell you everything I know and then you'll think like me. So it's simply saying, I'm going to tell you that we should care about sea level rise because I know that we should care about sea level rise and I'm going to tell you everything I know about sea level rise and then you'll care too. The problem is this kind of approach doesn't work. Uh, you have to work with people, you have to talk to people and the key tenant of it is you have to understand who you're speaking to and why. So first thing to do before you go any further in any project is to think about who your audience is, why they're reading your website or your whatever it is that you're building, your tool, why they're looking at it and what they need. You should make sure that your text is easy to understand and ideally have some kind of a story, some kind of narrative, human story. People really enjoy that. So if you're if you're out there doing field work, people would love to hear about it. If you're using UAVs or drones, people think that's cool, you know, talk about that. That's a hook that will get people interested. I try whenever I write an article to only have one point, one thing that I'm trying to tell people, not to go any further than that. And people like people like pretty pictures. People like cool little gizmos and funky things and nice pictures and things like that, particularly if they're interactive. And then the next thing that you probably need to think about is search engine optimization. You've seen where my traffic comes from. A very small proportion is coming from referrals and direct traffic. So that's people who already know about the website. Most of that traffic is coming from Google and organic searches. So if you want to make a resource that people are actually going to use and to find, you need to think about search engine optimization. 
the good news is that there probably aren't very many people providing outreach resources for coasts or glaciers or climate change or something. So it's not that crowded a market. It's not like you're trying to sell handbags or shoes where lots of people are trying to do that. But you need to be thinking about search engine optimization. And there's, you know, I just I just went to the to the to, I just went to Amazon and I bought a few a few books, a few basic primers about search engine optimization that was really helpful. And I think anybody who's thinking seriously about online digital communication, you must think about search engine optimization. And there's lots of resources out there. You know, I read I read a few books and then felt, you know, that I that I got the hang of it. So how do you think about who you are writing for? And think about what your target audience is, what are their needs, why are they reading your website? And that helps us move from this kind of patriarchal, top-down knowledge deficit approach to something that is more of a public engagement approach. So what do people need? So if you're producing a tool for flood mapping, who is that tool for? If you're using a tool for, you know, landslides, who is that tool for? Why are they why are they using them? You, know, you were working with, say perhaps you're working with policymakers, maybe you're working with the local town or county council, maybe you're working for writing for journalists, or perhaps you're working more with school teachers. I think one of the things that's interesting about my website is the website is read by school teachers who use the website to top up their own knowledge before they then go to teach it to the children. The children aren't really coming to the website, I think the website is used by teachers. So that's the audience. Perhaps you are working in a local project. So perhaps you have a site in the United Kingdom or in a certain country that is your, your study site. Perhaps you want to build some resources for the local community about that site. Maybe you're writing for other academics. Maybe you're writing for other students. Maybe you're writing for children. You need to think about what who you're writing for. Some of the most challenging audiences to reach extremely difficult audience to reach are people who are you know they have some kind of partisan view or they have they're sort of directly opposed to what you're trying to say um so people who are perhaps skeptics or you know climate change deniers anti-vax people those kinds of people are going to be really hard to reach so if you want to target them um you're gonna to have to think very carefully about how you would do that most websites that i see that are started with the best intentions you know someone gets a NERC grant they start a project associated with it or they start a PhD and they start a project with it most of them start with the very best of intentions but because they haven't thought about their audience they're only read by other academics and they're not really reaching anyone else so they're not fulfilling that remit of public engagement and because they haven't thought about search engine optimization they're not getting any traffic so if you're not getting any traffic, no one's reaching your website, then people move on and they do something else. It doesn't have that longevity. So you need to think about who you're writing for and why before you just dive in and start doing stuff. You need to think, you need to do your market research. You need to go and talk to people before you start. So if you're going to be writing a tool or making a tool for a particular audience, before you do anything, go and speak to that audience and spend time with them, and interview them, hold focus groups with them and work out what they need. Think about what their level of education is. Think about what their interests are. And the most important thing is why should they care and why is this relevant to them? You may know why it's relevant to them, but they need to be thinking about why it's relevant to them. And you need to ask them directly what is relevant to you and how can I help? The next thing that we need to think about is doing things in a different way. When we write academic papers or read academic papers, they tend to follow introduction, previous work, methods, results, discussion, conclusions. When we're writing for the public, we need to completely flip that order. People will read websites in an F shape. So they'll go down, across a little bit, down, across a little bit more, down, give up, go home. So. You may be familiar with the TLDR kind of thing, too long, didn't read. Basically, you want all those supporting details down at the bottom and you want the headline figure that you want people to know at the top because that's the bit that people will read. Most people will skim read something and then move on. So make sure that you've got something in bold at the top that tells them what they need to know. In order to work with our audiences, once you've understood who you're writing for and what's important to them, 
you can think about framing. So, for example, the story maps that we're making are very much framed in the context of UK Key Stage 3, and they're very much framed in terms of understanding Antarctica, which is part of their polar biomes curriculum. Uh, you need to be uh, using framing to highlight um, particular aspects of relevance to different people. So it's sometimes seen as um, perhaps a little bit manipulative, but I think and the, the papers you can read, like this Druckmann et al paper, they talk a lot about framing, um, but it's actually inevitable because it's a core concept of human communication. We need to break through these partisan identities, we need to get people to listen to us, and we need to set aside, the, set and train uh, these interpretive storylines that help people um, understand why something might be an issue. So my key things that you need to think about if you're going to write for science communication or develop tools for science communication are that you should put that most interesting bit at the beginning and you should highlight why you care for the audience and nobody ever reads anything more than 500 words long. Nobody ever, and people can only understand one point. So keep it short, keep it pretty simple, tell them why they should care. You should have done your market research and interviewed your audience and spoken with the audience and thought about who you're writing for and why. If you're, right, if you're trying to work with policymakers, you need to go speak to them. If you're working with school teachers, you need to go speak to them. If you're working with journalists, you need to go speak to them. Uh, if you're working with local people in a local town, you need to go speak to them. Uh, I prefer to write in the active voice to make it a little bit more direct, a little bit more exciting. And everybody likes nice pictures. So whenever you go do field work, take lots and lots of pictures and you have lots of things to, to, go, in, to, to go into your website. Um, and you should be able to, in any page or anything that you produce, you should be able to sum up in one sentence your point, your main argument you want people to take home. And then you should write it down and put it at the top. And that's everything else is then supporting that one key point that you said. People, some things that pe we, I mean, maybe this is not so relevant for this audience, but people are often afraid that they might get shouted at, that they might be ignored, that they might be wrong. Um, certainly this happens. Uh, I get a lot of comments on my website. Some of them, the tone is extremely angry. Uh, I get attacked personally in the comments on my website quite a lot. Um, I get people telling me all sorts of things. Um, I basically deal with that by moderating the comments and every single comment has to be approved. And I have set out my own rule, which is this is my website. It has my rules and you have to be nice. You have to be nice to have your comment approved. And I just, I just ignore it. Um, other people um, might find that more difficult or might take a different view about what makes a good conversation. But I think this kind of moderating approach is quite commonly used. Uh, people worry about being wrong. The, people find websites, uh, you know, little mistakes on Antarctic glaciers all the time. And I, I, you know, sometimes get an email from someone, from someone saying, "Oh, I think this is this is a slight error," and I just I just update it and change it. If I'm feeling enthusiastic, I might put a comment that says "edited" at some point on it. But generally, I just update it. I don't think it matters that much. Um, and then people also worry about breaking institutional rules. Uh, you can speak to your university about it. Personally, my university is really enthusiastic about Antarctic glaciers and have even given me lots of funding for it. So they, they really support it. Um, I've said search engine optimization is really important. Um, and I suggest that you read some of the literature. You know, there's plenty of blog articles uh, on books on how to do this. Um, but there are some really simple things you can do. Uh, if you're using WordPress, I use the Yoast plugin. It's a free plugin and it has a traffic light system. And if you're doing certain things, then it goes green. If you haven't done them, it goes red. And I quite like the simplicity of that. But there are certain things you can do, like think, what is the word that people are going to search for? And then you make that your keyword or your key phrase. And then that key phrase has to appear in the text, in the headings, in the figure alt image captions, in the image captions and in the URL. And that will help Google. The main thing Google wants is lots of content that's regularly updated. That's, you know, that helps Google decide that this is a good website. And links and backlinks are really important. You know, people sometimes say to me, oh, please can I link to your website? And I'm like, yeah, please do. The more people who link to my website, the more traffic I get. So as many incoming links and outgoing links as you can. There are, you can also pay lots of money to get someone help you with SEO. 
you can install Google Analytics, you can think about PageRank, you can work with professionals. So just to summarise some of the key lessons I've learned, that the content is the most important part of your website. Uh, know who you're writing for and why. Do you think about search engine optimization? Make sure people can understand it and use plenty of images to illustrate your article.